To begin with, I want to do something quite straightforward. I want you all to just think of a charity. It could be your favorite charity. Everyone got one? Now, would you think less of that charity if I told you that in the process of helping other people, they were also making a profit for themselves, they were making money? And would you think less of that charity if I told you that they were also spending a lot of money on administration, if every one dollar that you gave to them, only 50 cents, actually went to programs? You see, we all have expectations about what a charity should be and what a charity should do. When we think of a charity, we tend to think of an organization that raises money by collecting donations and then spends that money on worthwhile causes. We expect the charity to transfer the money as efficiently as possible, to spend the least amount of money as possible on things like administration. We certainly expect that the charity will operate on a non-profit basis. We don't want them making money off the poor. We expect them to provide their services free of charge. Low administration costs, non-profit, those things are all part of our idea of charity. Now, for about five years, I've been involved in an organization called 180 Degrees Consulting. And 180 Degrees is an organization that helps organizations to become more effective than they already are. It's an organization that provides consulting, affordable consulting all around the world. And through 180 Degrees, I've had the privilege uh, of meeting and interacting with hundreds of different people all around the world who have been involved in all different charities. And from meeting them and interacting with them and learning from them, a common theme keeps coming up. And that theme is that these people often feel constrained, boxed in, pigeonholed by the idea of what a charity should be. They feel pigeonholed and restricted by our traditional notion of charity. One of the main ways that they feel restricted is that we expect that they'll have low administration costs. Many charity comparison websites, such as Charity Navigator, Intelligent Philanthropy, and so on, all these still use administration expense as a key measure of the worth of charities. But administration expense shouldn't be the way that we assess charities. I mean, think about it. Would you prefer your money to go to an organization that spent 50% on admin, but ensure that the other 50 cents in the dollar was spent in a really good way, on an effective approach, where they had all the right checks and balances, where they measured their social impact, as opposed to an organization that spent 75 cents in the dollar, or 95 cents in the dollar on programs. But the approach that it was following wasn't that effective. It didn't have the right checks and balances. It couldn't guarantee that the 95 cents was used well. I mean, we don't choose to invest in Google or Apple based on the percent that they spend on admin. Now we choose to invest in these companies based on their financial return. And that's probably a good thing, because based on common ways of assessing charities, Apple has an overhead of 65%. Google has slightly higher. Google has an overhead of 74%. You see, in the for-profit world, when we're choosing to make for-profit investments, we recognize that administration expense isn't at all correlated with financial return. And it's about time that we realized in the charitable sector that administration expense also isn't correlated with social impact. And sometimes charities will need Google-sized expenditure to have Google-sized returns. A second way that we constrain charities is that we expect that they'll always operate on a non-profit basis. And whenever an organization purports to do good, but also makes money on the side, we, we question it. We question their motives. We think of them as uncharitable. But I want to ask us, is that really rational? Let me give you two examples. Say you walk into a restaurant and there's a sign on the wall that says, this restaurant donates 20% of the money that we make to charity. How do you feel about the restaurant? Now say you walk into a charitable organization, an organization mostly focused on doing good. Say a microfinance organization. And there's a sign on the wall that says, we keep 20% of the money we make, how do you feel about the organization? Now, some of you might like what the restaurant is doing, but not like what the microfinance organization is doing. But let's think about this. The restaurant is keeping 80% of the money that they make and just giving 20% to worthwhile causes. The microfinance organization is keeping just 20% and 80% is going to worthwhile causes. If anything, it should be the other way around. But for some reason, we tend to like organizations 
that mostly focus on profit and just have a bit of charity on the side. And we, for some reason, dislike organizations that are mostly focused on doing good, but have a small profit motive as well. I think the reason why we might think this way is that we assume that there's a trade-off. We assume that there's a trade-off between social returns and financial returns. We assume that if someone wins, if someone makes money, then someone else must lose. We assume that the microfinance organization should instead be operating on a purely non-profit basis. But this ignores the fact that often organizations need to make some money in order to attract the investment, in order to scale the business, to have the impact that they want. And scale is important. There are 780 million people in the world without access to water. There are 2.5 billion people in the world who don't have access to proper sanitation. 2.6 billion people in the world who don't have insurance protection to protect them from things like drought. Do you really think that we can rely on altruism to provide water, sanitation, insurance protection, and countless other things to that many people? The scale of the problems facing our world demands solutions that altruism can't provide. And just because an organization is making a bit of money doesn't mean it can't do a lot of good at the same time. And requiring that organizations always operate on a non-profit basis is constraining. Another way in which we restrict organizations, another way in which we treat them differently from how we treat businesses, is that we assess the worth of charities on the basis of anecdotal evidence. I'm sure you've all heard stories of lives being transformed by different charities. But the problem is that even bad programs can be made to sound impressive. I mean, you can have a program that has 99% of failure cases, 1% of success cases, and some amazing anecdotes. A story is a sample size of one. There's no knowing whether it's the norm or the exception. And so anecdotes are a pathetic measure of the worth of a charity. Why is this important? Why is this a constraint on charities, you might ask? It's because we want the best ideas to win out. We want the best ideas and the best approaches to be those that attract the most money, that attract the best talent. But in order to do this, we need to be more objective. We need to collect data, analyze data, in order to measure and compare the worth of different organizations. Because by relying on anecdotal evidence, we risk misdirecting funds and resources. And that's important. Indeed, economic research shows that for every $1 that someone gives to one cause, they give on, on average 50 cents less to another cause. There's a substitution effect. And so by raising money, for causes that only do some good, for programs that only have a marginal benefit, we're actually taking away money from the best approaches, from the best programs, the best organizations. And so what this means is that just because an organization does some good doesn't mean it should exist. It sounds a bit counterintuitive, but it's true that doing good isn't good enough. A fourth way in which we constrain charities is that we expect that they'll exist in perpetuity. We expect that charities will never fail. Now, in the for-profit business community, failure is not seen as a bad thing. It's just part of the process. Steve Jobs failed. His first computer, Apple Lisa, was a flop. Bill Gates failed with his business Trapper data. Richard Branson failed with Virgin Cola, plus countless other businesses. You see, failure is not seen as a bad thing. It's just means that you experimented, it means you were innovative, it means you tried something new. It means you're more experienced, more likely to succeed the next time. Unfortunately, we don't have the same thinking when it comes to charities. We expect that charities will always succeed, will always do good, will always have a social impact. And so as a result of this, charities are risk averse. They fear failure. They feel like they need to play it safe, like they can't take risks. But every charity playing it safe isn't going to achieve the rate of progress that we need. We need charities to try things that, if they work, will be transformative. If anything, charities should fail more than for-profit businesses. Here's why. When you make an investment, it makes sense to trade off risk and return because you only care about yourself. You care about what money you get back. But when we're talking about a charity, you care about the well-being of someone else. And so it doesn't matter if my donation doesn't have an impact or your donation doesn't have an impact. What matters is the overall impact. And because there are so many donors, so many charities, the risk is already diversified. And so to maximize the overall impact, we want each person and each charity to try things that won't always succeed, 
but that if they do succeed, will have a really big social impact. We constrain charities by not allowing them to fail. We constrain them by expecting they'll live forever. Besides, if charities and foundations do their jobs really well, they really should put themselves out of business. Lastly, I want to talk about the common perception. The perception that charitable work is for overly sensitive, emotionally charged do-gooders, rather than seeing it as an intellectual endeavour. Many university students I speak to say that they feel like they need to choose between doing good and actually being intellectually challenged. They think of charitable work as reasonably routine, reasonably mundane, with not much excitement, not many challenges. But I disagree. When there are so many different approaches, so many different ways of solving each problem, it's a real challenge to work out what's the best approach or to invent new and better approaches. Besides, running a charity is often more difficult than running a business. It's often more difficult to measure your social return than your financial return. It's often more difficult to motivate volunteers than to motivate employees whose pay and bonus depends on performance. It's often more difficult to run a business when you're expected to have the cheapest resources and not the best resources. And while I'm on the point of sort of careers and what paths we should each follow, just as sort of an aside, I often hear the comment that you can do more good by working for a large for-profit charity or a large foundation than working for a small charity or starting up your own charity. And I can see why people might think this way. Compare, for example, the Koch Foundation with a small charity. The Koch Foundation has more money, reaches more people, has a bigger social impact. I think last year they gave out about $70 million to various causes. If we divide the impact of the organisation by the number of people, it's probably also true that the per-person impact of the Koch Foundation is far greater than the per-person impact of a small charity. But it doesn't follow that you can necessarily have a greater impact working for the Koch Foundation than a small charity. Because the crucial question we all need to ask ourselves is what would happen if we weren't there? If you didn't work for the Koch Foundation, chances are someone else would. Someone who's probably about as smart as you, probably about as good as you, and probably going to have about the same social impact as you. And if someone else would have about the same social impact as you, then you being there doesn't actually increase the overall impact. And if someone else would have done a better job than you, then you being there can actually have a negative incremental impact. Compare that with starting a charity. The overall impact might be quite small. You might not change the world. You might not even change a large community. But at least your incremental impact will be positive. And so I think we need to move away from the idea that bigger is better, that you can always have a larger social impact working for a large foundation or a large for-profit company. We need to ask ourselves, what would otherwise happen? And we need to work and choose careers for which we have a unique advantage, for which we're uniquely qualified, where we can make a unique contribution. I think it's about time uh, that I conclude. There is a plethora of ways that we can make a difference. There's a plethora of ways to help people. And we all know that there are many different ways to achieve the same outcome. Say we all want to improve literacy and educational outcomes. We could hand out books in developing countries. That's what Better World Books does. We could hand out laptops, which is what one laptop per child does. We could build schools, the approach of the 40K Foundation. We could train teachers to be better teachers. Or we could pay for more teachers to have smaller class sizes. Or we could develop a program to mentor disadvantaged students through school. We could develop an online platform for free high quality video education, Khan Academy. We could develop a website where anyone can contribute their knowledge and it can be accessed free of charge anywhere in the world, Wikipedia. We could develop a program where the best university graduates go to work in the worst schools and help out students who are struggling. Teach for America. We could build libraries. We could reward students for improving. We could even develop apps so that children in Africa and India can teach themselves. You get the point. There are so many different ways to help people. And when we calculate how much each of these programs cost, and when we calculate how many more people become literate as a result, 
we realize that different approaches have dramatically different results. Some are 10 times, even 100 times, even 1,000 times more effective than other approaches. And so what this means is that it's more important that charities have the right approach, the right ideas, than that they have lots of money to spend on worthwhile causes. If we double the amount of money a charity has, that'll increase the effectiveness of that charity by two times. But if we can actually ensure that that charity has the right approach, the right ideas, then we can improve the effectiveness by 10 times, 100 times, even 1,000 times. In the game of social impact, method trumps money. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to do good, in order to have the greatest impact, in order to best support charities, in order for us to be truly charitable, we need to be prepared to change our conception of charity. Just because a charity spends a lot on admin doesn't mean it's wasting money. Just because an organization tries something new that fails doesn't mean that that charity is a failure. Just because a charity makes profit doesn't mean it's exploiting the poor. Just because a charity has the best story doesn't mean it's the best charity. And just because we get emotional about causes doesn't mean that charitable work is an emotional endeavor. There are so many different ways to help people, and our traditional notion of charity is just one of those ways. We've put charities in a box for far too long. Let's set them free. Thank you very much.